All right. Pastor is not here, but just so we are clear, I'm not the pastor, okay? <laughs> not today. I'm just, I'm just standing in the gap. It's good seeing you guys, and let's just get up and give a shout of praise to God because he's good all the time. All right, let's all sit down and let's pray. Almighty God in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this day. Uh, it's a day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, even as we, you speak through me and to us, I pray that, Lord, may your spirit be upon us. May you speak and may we listen. May we be able to understand and know and hear your voice that will be able to serve you better and to obey your word. Let your presence be in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. All right, I'm nervous, okay? And I have an accent, so if you need a translator, raise up your hand. All right, so we're good, everybody's good. Um, originally, I'm from Africa, and my accent is a little bit, you know. Now, if you went to Africa, I would be the one saying, hey, you have an accent, right? Because you will be in Africa. My work today here is very simple. I'm not a traditional preacher. I speak the word of God as the Spirit has, has put on my heart. But before we start, on the 27th of August, is it, yeah. am I right? We will begin our small groups. So make sure that you are connected to a small group. I'm not sure if everybody knows their you know, small group. If you don't, get with Chip or Pastor next weekend or Kim or any usher and get your group and make sure that you are connected. Today I want us to speak about the Great Commission. You know, a lot of times the first thing that Christ did or the last thing that he did before he went to heaven was to do a Great Commission. After he's done all the miracles, after he's saved a lot of souls, he gave a commandment right before. In our ordinary lives, we would say that was a dying man's wish, right? In the will, say, before I go, of course, he went to heaven, he was alive. This is what I want you to do, and it's known as the Great Commission. If we can turn our Bibles to Matthew. Let's read from Matthew 28, 16 up to 19. When the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountains which Jesus had appointed them to, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke and saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Mark 16, 14, 18 says, Later he appeared to the eleven, and they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of their hearts, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe shall be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will take up, up the serpents and they will drink anything deadly. It will be by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall get healed. Praise the Lord. Now, video team, I'm sorry. I like moving around. Oftentimes, we get saved. 
we get salvation. Salve what is it not salvation? It's a personal relationship with Christ, right? It is, I think what we miss is it's a relationship. Most of us here are couples, or you have kids, right? Or you have friends. A relationship is nurtured. A relationship can die, right? A relationship can blossom, depending on how you nurture it. And in a relationship, it's a two-way between individuals. If it is a one-way, then it's not what? A relationship, right? If it is a two-way, I mean, we have marriages, hey, where a marriage is dead, but you're still married, right? <laughs> but deep down your heart, you know, I don't love this guy anymore, or I don't love this lady anymore. Or it's like there's no spark. So a relationship has to be nurtured now. That is the same thing with Christ. Our relationship with Christ is personal. It has to be, every day you wake up, you determine, I need a relationship with Christ. I have to be in a relationship with Christ. Because if you don't make that choice every day, then there might be no relationship, right? Now, when Christ left, he gave, it's now, it's called the Great Commission. Go ye all unto the earth, preach the gospel, make disciples of every creature. Now, I haven't yet preached to a lion yet, so I don't know how to make a disciple out of a lion, right? Or a tiger, but human beings, people. Now, if we read a lot of scriptures, it, there's where he said, go preach the gospel starting from Jerusalem. Now, that is key. Let me not get off, off my notes, you know. Let me make sure that I'm within my notes. So, he said, go and make disciples. He said, how do we, how do we obey? How do we get involved into the Great Commission. Remember, this is not optional. This is not for a pastor. This is not for a prophet. This is not for a volunteer, okay? This is for every individual who says, Christ, I have accepted you as my Lord and Savior, okay? So this is for everybody, all of us, whether you are seated there or you're up here, whether you, whether you are in hospital or you are at home, whether you, as long as you're able to witness the message of Christ. That is what we ought to do. What is the first thing that you have to do? Born again, right? You have to be born again for you to witness, for you to be involved in the Great Commission. Let me ask, what is the first thing before you take a, a, a girl out for a date? You have to like her, right? I don't know if you'll go and ask a girl you don't like that, you know, can I take you out for a date? No, right? I mean, maybe there are exceptions. I don't know. I, I don't do that. Okay, so you have to be born again. How do we become born again? The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Christ Lord is your Savior. Now, two things. There is belief. Okay? And there is what? Confession. With our belief in our faith, in our hearts, we are justified. Right? That's what the Bible says. But with our mouth, when we confess, that's when we get saved. Now, I don't know everybody. There are people who want to keep their salvation a secret. I don't know how that works. Ladies, is it okay for a man to keep his love for you a secret? Would you really think he loves you? If he can't even say, hey, babe, I love you, you know? Or whatever words, you know, people in love say. But he has to say the words, right? Even with Christ, you have to, you have to confess your love for him. You have to confess your obedience to him. You have to confess your loyalty to him. That is why we pray. That is why we kneel down and we pray. That is why we do all these things because we have to confess it with your mouth. Jesus said, he who is ashamed of me on earth, I will be ashamed of them where? 
in front of my Father in heaven. Now, if you are if you are in salvation right now, if you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you are ashamed of confessing that, of saying it, of telling those around you that you love Christ, then you don't, I mean, I'm not going to judge you, but I don't know if you love him, okay? Just like we want to be told, I love you, you know, I'm proud of you, you know, you're my friend, you're the best. Christ wants to hear that from us. The same way that we want when we read the Bible. Christ has done all these things. He's, he tells you, I love you. He tells you, I'll be with you until the end of the time. He tells you, whatever you ask for in my name, I shall give it. Everything that is in the Bible, he has spoken it to us. So why should we not speak it back to him? It is a relationship. So the first thing that we have to be is be born again. You can't witness what you don't know. Right? You can't, you can't speak of something that you have no idea of. Now, um, how many of you have been to Uganda? I mean... Okay, I, I, I didn't see that coming. It's like... <laughs> it's, it's like me asking how many Americans have been to America and, uh, you know, every... Everybody will raise up their hands. But how many people have been to Africa apart from the Africans? <laughs> raise up your hand. What country? Zimbabwe. Okay. So when you sit down with your friends and you're speaking about your trip to Zimbabwe, you're witnessing what you have experienced. Would you be able to witness or tell people about your experience in, in Sudan when you've not been there? No, right? Witnessing, you have, to be, you have to have been born again. You have to know Christ. Who is Christ? If somebody comes and asks you, who is Christ, and you don't know him, what would be your answer? I don't know, right? Or you'll be like, I think he's the son of God, you know? Like, you have no idea. So you tell me how you will witness about Christ if you don't know who Christ is, if you have not received him in your life as he, your savior. I tell my kids um, that every, we, we take you to church, okay? You pray and we do all these things in the evening and we speak about the word of God. But salvation is not a family thing. It never will be. Salvation is not a clan thing. It's not... It's not a church thing. Salvation is a personal thing. The Bible says that every human being, each of us will stand before the throne of God to give account of our lives. If you read in Revelation, it says when, in, during the time of rapture, it says two will be sleeping in a bed, one will go, the other one will stay. Okay? They will be driving... Those who believe in Christ, you will go as an individual. So your salvation is between you and your God, first and foremost. When you know God, when you know Christ, then you can witness about Christ. Then you can tell people about who Christ is, what, what he has done in your life, how he died on the cross, what he did, all these things that the Bible says he has done. But it's because you are talking on a point of understanding and knowing who Christ is. Not at, at an angle of, how do they call it? Um, the crowd factor. You know, like if, if there is, uh, if, there is a riot, okay, and or oh, there is a strike at your place of work, you know. It's a crowd thing. Everybody say, hey, all of us, let's do this. But when you are isolated and say, were you in the riot, you know, when you are arrested by the police, it will not be the whole crowd, right? It will be you and the law and say, yeah, you know, my friend, you know, well, you were there, right? You're guilty. So salvation is not a crowd thing. Salvation is a personal thing. It is a, a you thing, you and God. What you do between you and God, God sees and you know it. When we reflect in our lives, we all know whether we are right with God or not, right? 
when we go back in our bedrooms and you sit back and say, okay, what is my relationship with God? Let me tell you, we all know where we are, okay, where we stand. You know, we can be out here, and, but when we go back, we know where we stand. And that is a good thing when you reflect about your salvation. You know where you stand, and so you know what to do. If you're not in the right standing with God, and don't confuse it with, with being righteous. No. The Bible says that we are saved by grace. Okay? We are saved. All of us are saved. As long as you have received Christ, you're born again. You're saved. But now the question is, now that you've been saved, what are you doing with that salvation? How is your walk with Christ? Now that that lady has said, yeah, I love you too, what are you doing with that relationship? Do you respect her? Do you love her? Do you show that you love her? Or because she has already said yes, you sit back and relax and say, all right, you know? <laughs> hey, another guy will come and tell her and do better things to, for her and you might lose her, right? So if you want to stick with her, she needs to wake up every day knowing this guy shows me that I love her. Or this lady shows me that I love him. Same thing with Christ. You will get salvation. I believe we lose our salvation. It's not a guarantee that when you get salvation, you cannot lose it. If you don't, Paul says, it's not about you have to run the race. The race of salvation, the objective is for you to run until the end. If you drop off in the middle, you have not arrived to the end. So you have to work your salvation. Another place in the Bible it says, work your salvation every day with fear and trembling. That means you can't just get salvation and sit back and relax. No. You have to work on it every single day. Say that at the end of the day, you are actually saved. I'm going off track, but it's still within track. All right. Number two. Um, I mean, born again, there are very many verses that says, in uh, John, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 5 up to 6 says, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, one is, unless one is born of water, and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is of flesh. And that that is born of the spirit is of the spirit. And then, of course, the most famous Bible, or I mean verse of the Bible that everybody here knows, John 3.16, what does it say? Everybody. I'm hearing. <laughs> okay. Everybody has to know that verse. Okay? Because that is the anchor of our salvation that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. At least if you don't know any other verse in the Bible. <laughs> so, number one, be born again. And there's so many verses you can go and read about you born again. Number two, have a personal experience with Christ Jesus and share that experience. Acts 1 8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then it says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. But the one that I really want us to share is the one of Paul's um, Acts 9, 3, 7. There are so many examples in the Bible that people have an experience with Christ. Okay? And they are changed. Once you have an experience, a personal experience with Christ, then you can be able to go. Alright, let me, let me ask you. For those of you who like vacationing and going out, if you have an experience with a tiger... You've gone to a game park, okay? 
I've had an experience with, I think, a lion, no, an elephant. You never, you'll never forget it, right? Every time you see, you will get PTSD, okay? Because you're like, oh my God, I, I almost got eaten. But this is the reverse with Christ. When you have an experience with Christ, you will speak of that experience to whoever cares to listen. If we read about Paul, Paul, everybody knows he was Saul. When he was Saul, he was this guy who, who persecuted Christians. Literally, he was legally allowed to go and persecute Christians in every corner of Israel. So, he goes to Damascus. He tells his, his bosses, I need to go to Damascus. I hear there are Christians there hiding. I want to go and get them out and persecute them. On his way there, he gets an encounter with Christ Jesus. And I think it's Acts 9, 3, 17, 3 up to 7. Let me just read that. Um, it says, as he neared in Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I mean, this is ironical because he's saying, Who are you, Lord? Like, how did he know that is Lord? I mean, so he says, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus answered, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. He replied, Now, get up and go into the city. And you will be told what to do. Let me tell you something. Was Paul's life the same? When Moses experienced God in the burning bush, was his life the same? When Aaron experienced God, was his life the same? You can name all, all characters in the Bible. When King Saul... If you remember when he was anointed and he was on his way to look for his dad's, you know, cows, I think herds, and then he met um, the prophet and the spirit of God came over him. Was he the same? David, I mean, name Samuel, all the, these characters, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, your life is never the same. David, the Bible says, because he knew, he experienced God every time when he was bringing the ark of the Lord back into uh, the city of David in Jerusalem. He danced in front of the ark of the Lord until he was almost naked. And his wife was saying like, hey, how can a king dance? And he said, I don't care about you. I know the God that I serve. If you have a personal experience with God, what is witnessing? Witnessing is for you to share your experience. But what will you witness if you don't have that experience? Yes, you are born again, right? You have salvation. But have you had a personal experience with God? Has Christ, has God moved in your life in a way that you know this is not a hand of, of, of a human? This is not my own doing. This is the doing of God. That is something that every Christian, that is something you and I need to experience. Not only once. If you've experienced it once, you have something to talk about. If you experience it every week, you have something to talk about every week. If you experience it every day, you're almost in heaven. <laughs> I don't remember the, the verse, but there's where it says that, come, test the Lord for test the goodness of the Lord that is something that I want all of us to desire every day in, in our walk with Christ that God move in my life move in my family move in my situation move in whatever thing that you're in move in my church when you have that experience with God look most people think that witnessing or the Great Commission is going on the streets and getting a mic and saying, praise the Lord, I am I'm born again and I'm bringing the good news. Yes, it is. 
But it's more than that. Christ says, go and witness starting from, from Jerusalem. Are you witnessing to your husband? Are you witnessing to your wife? Do you witness in your family, to your children? That is where I should start from. From Jerusalem, from your home. From you yourself. Share the experience of God. There's no way you're going to share the experience of God with a stranger if you can't share it with your wife or your husband. Would you? I mean, then there will be something strange if that happens. Okay? That you're, you're, you're able to witness to others but not your family, right? You start from home. Witness to your kids. That is how it starts. Then he said, from Jerusalem. Your Jerusalem is the people around you. Your workplace. Your friends. Your neighborhood. Then you can go to Samaria and to Judea to enter the ends of the world. So everybody needs to have an experience with God. Have that experience. Taste that experience. Desire it. Every day desire it. If you don't desire it, you won't get it. If you don't ask for it, you don't what? For everyone who asks, it was given unto him. Whoever knocks the door, the door was open. All right? So you have to ask. You have to desire. You have to seek for it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all it, with all its righteousness. And all these other things shall be added unto you. What does the word seek mean? Does it mean you just walk over there and you just pick it up because it's there? No. You have, you have to put effort. You have to put time. You have to put resources. You have to seek the kingdom of God. You have to read the Bible. You have to pray. You have to set time for God. You have to do the things of God. That is seeking the kingdom of God. Do you know why God called David a man after his own heart? It's not because he was righteous. In any case, you know, David was an adulterer. He was a polygamist. He was a murderer. He was, he was everything that you can think of. Okay? His life was not perfect. But God says he looks at the heart of man and not your appearance. He looked at the heart of David. And David's heart was always in the things of God. No matter how he fell. He fell like a thousand times. But every time he fell, God knew David's heart was with him. The things of God. David refused to kill Saul because Saul was an anointed man of God. He said, I cannot touch the anointed of God. Yet he had all these opportunities. That tells you that David knew the word of God. When David sinned, David would always say, God, I would rather you punish me than you giving me to man because I know you are gracious. David would go back and repent of his sins every single time. And God called him a man after my own heart and made him uh, a great grandfather to Jesus and set his kingdom forever because of Christ Jesus. So let's have an experience with Christ Jesus. Desire it, pray for it, seek for it. And I'm telling you, when you have an experience with God, you will witness whether you like it or not. I'm telling you. Whether it is to your friends, you will wake up and say, man, the other day I, my wife was in hospital and she had even lost breath, but out of nowhere, I prayed, we prayed, and God healed her. I don't know how, but God healed her. What do you think you're doing? You're witnessing, right? Oh, I was sick, or I've been looking for a job for three years and I didn't have a job, but God has brought this amazing, awesome job that I didn't even think I would get it. Or, you know, my child was failing, his grades were low, and I went to God, I sought God, I prayed, and now he's excelling in his grades. It does not matter what it is. When you experience God, you will witness about him. If you don't have an experience with God, your witnessing will be theoretical. And we all know theory has no affirmation. But if it is experience, you know what you are talking about. And it doesn't matter whether people will believe it or not. That is not your business. When you talk about Jesus Christ, it is not your business whether they believe in that word or not. That is the Holy Spirit business. The Bible says it is the Holy Spirit that draws the hearts of men to God. 
So when you witness about God, don't worry about how many people have gotten saved. Is that your business? No. God didn't say go and save people, right? No, he said go witness. Those who believe, baptize them and make them disciples. He didn't say go and make sure they get saved. No, that's not, it's, it's none of your business. We have our roles. Our, our role as his followers is to witness, to share our experiences with God. And the rest, let him do the rest. Let God do the rest. We get confused and we want to do God's role. Come on, man. You can't even save yourself. Yeah. How can you save the rest? You cannot. Okay? So let's stick to our roles and let God do his role. Okay? Um, I don't know how many minutes I have remaining. But number three is say yes. Obedience. Now, if there's anything that God hates, let me not use the word hates. If anything that the Bible says God wants, it's obedience. When God calls us and he has called all of us, he expects you to say yes, to obey. Now, most times we want to sit back and put a lot of thinking into these things. If, 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 if I go and preach, what will happen? Uh, if I go and witness, how will the other person look at me? Okay? But the, God really just wants you to say yes. In whatever shape. I love what we do here. We say that, you know, we bring people from wherever they are into a growing relationship with Christ Jesus, right? God doesn't care who you are. Anybody knows the story of King Nebuchadnezzar? Raise up your hand if you've read about Nebuchadnezzar. So this is one of the guy was an evil king. But do you know what God did through Nebuchadnezzar? Everything God does is for his own glory. Not yours, not mine. I work with the military and they will give an order. Somebody you don't know about. We don't, you don't know how he gets that, makes that decision and he passes the order down. But you do it, right? You just do it. You're, you, sometimes you don't understand what it is for. Right? That is none of your business. Your business is to do it. God wants us to say yes. And if we read in, uh, in Romans, Romans 10, 14 up to 15, say, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard of? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and who bring glad tidings to good things. Basically, how will people know about Christ if we don't talk about Christ? Think about it. You guys at your workplace, how many people know about Christ? In the United States, preaching is something that is very sensitive. Okay? When you speak about God, it's like everybody turns around and says, hmm? Actually, it's, it's easier for you to talk about homosexuality, for example. And everybody says, yeah, you know, that's okay. But when you mention the name of Jesus, it's like you're an outcast. And as Christians, we, we have how... Or let me... If I offend anybody's feelings, I'm sorry. I'm just speaking what God has put in my heart, okay? So if there's anybody you should sue, you should sue God, okay? Not me. All right. But as Christians, I realize we fear to offend people. We want to live in an environment where we are accepted, where we don't step on people's toes. But I can assure you the gospel of Christ is going to step on people's toes. 
It's the truth. I, 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 my friends know me as this out, you know, direct guy, okay? I don't know how to sugar cord. I don't know. I, 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 one time I was in Afghanistan, I told my wife, so the job I was working in, my supervisor, you know, she was heavy set, you know, and I know there are words you're not supposed to say in America. We say it in Africa, but not here. So she asked me that, Bosco, I know you are a very honest guy, so tell me the truth. You know I've been going to the gym, okay? And I feel like I've lost weight. Have I lost weight? So I looked at her and I said, not that I see. <laughs> so she goes off on me and said, man, at least you lie a little bit. I said, but you came to me because, you know, I'm honest. So why would you want me to lie? I'm telling you the truth. Now, there are certain things that the Bible speaks about. That if you're going to talk the gospel of Christ, there is no gray area. It is truth, it is righteousness, or unrighteousness. If you find me stealing, are you going to tell me that, you know, I don't know what you're doing is right. You have to tell me that, dude, what you're doing is wrong. The Bible condemns it. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. That is what the word of God says. Now, are we Christians that are going to stand by the word of God or are we going to, st to go with the flow? Okay? This is the flow. This is the politically correct, you know? Let me tell you something. Do you ever hear in any part of the world where the governments say anything about Muslims and say homosexuality or with things that Islam does not condone. Nobody talks about it, right? Because Muslims will riot. They will burn buildings down if you touch their religion, okay? <laughs> they, don't, they, don't, they don't play those things. The only religion that every government is playing with is our faith. They don't want to see you praying in, cha I mean, in school because there should be a separation between school. How do you call it? Separation of church and... What does my prayer in school have to do with politics? Okay? What does me saying I love Christ is my Lord and Savior have to do with your government? If you tell me about everything that the government does, why can't I tell you about what Christ is doing in my life? You know? So... I think it's time for us to know who we serve. Who are we? First, we, we don't want to lose ourselves in the crowd of what is politically correct. We have to go back and realize, who am I? You are a child of God that has been purchased by the blood of Christ. Tell me who in this world has died for you. So who should your loyalty be? The man who died for you and you're going to have eternal life or the man who will just destroy your body and your spirit will be intact. The Bible says, fear he who destroys both body and spirit and not just he who destroys only the body. So we need to know who. What was I saying again? <laughs> Say yes. yes. Okay? Obey. Obey the commandment. This is what God says. God has told us, let's go out there and make disciples. How many minutes do I have? Huh? Three? Oh my God. All right. So, so say yes, okay? Finally, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not it is not, it's not automatic. It's not instant that when you, when you get saved, when you confess your Lord and Savior, that you instantly get filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? You'll get you know, salvation. You'll go to heaven if you die, but you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was living, he told his disciples, I want you to go to 
Jerusalem, wait until the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus himself, he did not start his, um, his ministry until when he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove and filled him. Then he started his ministry of, 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 of preaching. Meaning, we have to have the whole, we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is something that for some people, it's instant. For some people, it takes a short time. Other people, it takes a long time. But that is something that you have to desire. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. There is nothing that we can do without the Holy Spirit. If you read everything that Jesus said, and those that believe in me, they will do the following. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit that we shall be able to do this. Now, anybody understood that? So, that is my language. The Bible says, if you're filled with your Holy Spirit, you can start speaking my language. Okay? You can start speaking any other language. You, can, you will pray for the sick. You lay your hands on the sick and they will get healed. Because it is not you who is doing it. But it is he that is in you that is using you to do everything that we do. So we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Pentecost had to happen so that the disciples will be able to do the work of God. Christ has to be, had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so many other people in the Bible... The Holy Spirit is the key to everything that we do. He is our helper. Without Him, you're nothing. Completely nothing. You lay your hands on the sick, even in your heart, you lay your hands and you'll know that this man will not get healed. Right? Because there's no Holy Spirit and it's not your power. But when we submit ourselves, when we desire the Holy Spirit, we have to tell, seek Him and say, Holy Spirit, Come fill me. Come use me. Let your power fill me. I want to do great things for God. I want all these promises that you have said you'll promise. When you read in the New Testament, it says the fruits of the Holy Spirit are love, you know, patience and all that stuff. You cannot get those things unless you have the Holy Spirit. As I end, I want to say I think the most important thing as born again Christians is to have the Holy Spirit. If you have not been filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to start desiring the Holy Spirit. If you want to do great for God, you need to start desiring the Holy Spirit. Don't get, don't get, ah, what do I want to say? Don't be scared of speaking in tongues, okay? Don't be scared of jumping around when there is praise and worship because the Holy Spirit is in you. Don't be scared of prophesying because the Spirit of God is in you. We should get used to those things because it is not our power. It is not by power. It is not by might. It is by the Spirit of God. I want to hear people start speaking in tongues in church. I want to hear people prophesying here. I want to hear people laying hands, see people laying hands on the sick and they get healed. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. So we need to start desiring the Holy Spirit so that we can walk, we can move with God. We can walk in the direction of, we will not just walk anyhow because that is what our mind says, but it's because that is what the Spirit of God says. Praise the Lord. I want all of us to stand up right now. And I just want, as we play the music, I want all of us to pray. Let's just ask God to give us the Holy Spirit. Let's ask God, let's ask Him to give us the hearts of obedience. Let's ask Him that we want to be workers. We are our potters, okay? We are clay. He is the one that molds us into who we should be. We have, if we are going to do things for Christ, then we need to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we can do great things. Let's pray. Let all of us just pray. Take a minute and pray and ask God to give you the Holy Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you and we know we are nothing without you. We are nothing without the Spirit of God. We are nothing without your power. For your word says that it's by your power. It is by the might. It's by the Spirit of God 
that we do what we do. Lord, we open up our hearts and we start desiring the Spirit of God. We start desiring you to fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit. We start desiring that God, you will anoint us, anoint each and every body in this church. That God, we shall begin witnessing. We shall be a part of the great great commission that we shall go out and witness that we shall experience you that we shall we shall know who you are in our lives and that we shall go and witness our experience to the rest of the world lord use us use us oh god in the name of jesus christ i pray amen and father god even as we go home i pray that you take us home and you'll protect us in Jesus' name i want us to do one thing we've I haven't heard it, but can all of us say our Lord's Prayer? And then we can get this passed. Our Father, who art in heaven, allowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you and have a blessed week.